There are certain topics that we love. We love it when a good grace and mercy passage comes along because we, we just can't sleep on Saturday night because we want to get up here and tell you about God's grace and mercy. And then there are other Saturday nights that we don't sleep as well because we know that we're going to be talking about like sin or judgment or something that's not quite as popular as grace and mercy. It doesn't rile us up. And then uh, there's this third category of passages, and I can't speak for all pastors, but it makes me nervous. And it's the don't mess with that verse. Uh, scripture. Like, uh, just, you can preach anything you want. I'm, I'm cool with you doing some weird stuff, but don't mess with that verse. That, that is my verse. And, and so today, I'm, I may mess with uh, one of those verses uh, a little bit with you. I remember uh, as a college student, it, a pastor preached a sermon in the Old Testament, this, uh, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. And I had always understood that is to be a passage that told you how much you could take, like how much vengeance you could enact. And I remember when that passage got flipped upside down for me to say, no, no, no. It was actually quite the opposite. It was to limit what you could do to someone else. Uh, if, if they damaged your eye, you could do no more than damage their eye. It was a thing that limited how much vengeance you could take out on someone else. And it just flipped my perspective on that verse from that day forward. And so this may be one of those days uh, that your perspective gets flipped a little bit, and it could be one of those days where you just shake your head and you're like, that guy's crazy. All right, so uh, we're going to have some fun today. My, my son Keegan just went to summer camp. Uh, is that a bunch of the, the kids in this church, I think we had 12 or 30, I don't know, I wasn't there, so it's not really important for me to know how many were there, but Keegan went to this camp, and they do all kinds of stuff. They, they have activities, they have chapel services and recreation. One of my favorite things about this camp is they force every camper to take a shower every day. <laughs> every day. Cleanliness is next to godliness, right? So you get your camper back smelling more or less like you got them when you dropped them off uh, at the beginning of the week. But... <clears throat> This particular week, they, they have a thing where they do small groups, and they, they are in a smaller group with uh, kids their age from, from all over the state of Florida, and see, some kids that are even outside of the state of Florida. And at the beginning of the week, these kids don't know each other. They don't, they don't know anything about each other. So they do some of these icebreaker kind of activities so that they can get to know one another. And, and Jay Becker, our youth director, uh, was Keegan's small group leader. And he was the uh, only, uh, Keegan was the only kid from our church in his small group. And we were talking on the phone <laughs> during the week at camp, Jay and I, and he said, I got to tell you this story, man. One of the icebreakers was that classic question, if you could invite any three people to dinner, who would you invite? And you can just imagine all these boys and girls going into sixth grade, that's about the age they were, saying all of these pop stars and these athletes and the, these famous people. And then it comes to, to Keegan, my son Keegan, pastor's son Keegan. Who would you take to dinner if you could invite three people? Well, I guess I'd take my mom, <laughs> my dad, my sister. <laughs> Deep thoughts by Keegan, right? Like seriously, all the people throughout history and you pick the three people that you eat dinner with pretty much every night of the week. Like you're the pastor's son, like you have to throw Jesus in there. Like he's gotta be one of the three, man. Like, I mean, if you're not gonna go Father, Son, Holy Spirit, you gotta include Jesus. That boy. He's not here today, so I can tell that story. <laughs> but I think some of us, if we had the opportunity, we too would invite Jesus. How many of you say, I, I, I think I would probably invite Jesus? Yeah. You better raise your hand. You're in church. The pastor is asking you, <laughs> do you want to eat with, with Jesus? And you, I mean, if you have your hand down. I'm... But here's what I think. I, I think we have this, this romanticized idea that if we were to sit down with Jesus, we would ask Jesus these questions. These things that have kind of been bugging us. The, the questions that nobody's been able to answer uh, in a satisfactory fashion for us. And we have this idea that we, we would ask him these things. And he would answer us. And then we'd, we would sing Kumbaya, a few verses of that. And then he would go on and we would just bask in the glory of what that was. Here's the interesting thing. I don't know if you read scripture much, but when people ask Jesus questions, very rarely does he actually answer their question. Many times, he answers their question with another question. And then it goes down some rabbit trail, and Jesus is off the hook. And so, 
I think we have this idea of what dinner with Jesus would be like. But then I also think if you were to ask some of his closest friends and followers, if you were to ask them, hey, I can invite three people. Do you think I should invite Jesus? I think some of them would say, probably, but let me just tell you. Dinner with Jesus can get really weird really fast. Say that with me. Really weird really fast. You're like, what? Are you reading the same Bible I am? Yes, I am. And I'm going to take you through a little bit of a very weird dinner. And it got weird really fast, all right? And these are the verses that lead up to our I am passage that we're going to look at today. And so more than the the goal here today is not that you necessarily know what Jesus was saying, but that you would know the heart behind what Jesus said was saying. And we have got to look at a couple of different contexts to pull that out this morning. Nod your head if you're with me, all right? So uh, it was towards the end, Jesus knew that the the cross was looming. He he knew that that was coming, and he he gathered his uh, disciples for a meal uh, in the upper room. And this was, uh, it's it's a famous meal that happened. And right off the bat, he did something that he never should have done. There, there's no record that he uh, did it before, and it was, it was just really culturally strange that he did it. When you would walk into a place, it was customary for there to be a servant or a, a slave servant who would take a basin and they would wash the feet uh, of the guests who were there. And there were certain things that certain people did that other people wouldn't do. When Rick and I traveled over to a part of Asia this year, we saw this just lived out, how there were these kind of different classes of people. And the the people up here, there were certain things. They would never clean the toilet. They would never do these certain things because you're up here. And so in Jesus' days, uh, he was a, a religious leader. Uh, he, was, he functioned as a rabbi for these 12 guys who were following in his ways. He would be the last person in the room that would grab a basin and begin to wash the feet of his disciples. It was odd. It was strange. It was weird. It was a weird thing for Jesus to do. And he didn't just let it sit there. He used it as a teaching moment And when he was done washing their feet, he basically looks at them and says, hey, this is the model for what it means to be a leader. He says, I've given you a pattern so that you can do things the same way that I have done them unto you. So they're at this dinner. It's really weird. Jesus has washed their feet. That's odd. Hopefully that's the strangest thing that happens at this dinner. But as the conversation begins to continue on, Jesus reveals that one of those guys, and this is a a tight-knit group of friends, he reveals that one of them is going to betray Jesus that very night. You want to talk about some drama? Can you imagine being at a a family, friends, kind of a dinner, and the person who has kind of brought this thing all together kind of cryptically says, one of you is going to betray me tonight, and then reveal who that is. And many of us who who know the story know that that was the man Judas. Judas was going to betray Jesus, and he ended up doing that. But if you you look at what it says, it says that Judas got up and left. So now one of the dinner party guests has actually left. I'm not going to ask you to show your hand, but if you have ever been at a, a gathering where everybody was expected to stay from start to finish... But, but something came up and a person left kind of in a huff, that is weird. That is awkward. I don't know if you've ever been there. You're like, yep, that's me. That's, I'm that guy. I walk out all the time. But it's weird. And everybody else is left kind of sitting around the table going, oh, my goodness, there's like tension at this dinner because sometimes dinner with Jesus gets really weird really fast. And so... They get that out of the way. And then just Jesus reveals to them in this moment that he is leaving them, but he is going somewhere that they can't go right now. So that we have the weird washing feet thing. We have the, the, the betrayal statement. We have Judas leaving. The, the tension is high. And then Jesus drops this bombshell and says, oh, by the way, we've been doing this life together for several years. I'm, I'm leaving you guys. I'm not going to be around, and you can't, you, you can't go with me right now. That is, 
That's weird. What do, you mean, what do you mean you're going somewhere we can't go with you? We go with you everywhere, Jesus. We follow you everywhere. No, where I'm going right now, you can't go with me. Ah, just a strange thing. I don't know if you've ever moved. Uh, when you're a pastor and you know that like, your time is coming, in the Methodist church is a little different. They can just kind of boss you around and tell you where to go. But in other churches, uh, you, you kind of have some... Is that, well, I should have said that differently. When your boss is on the front row going like this, mm. you know you butchered that one. Let's just say they work with you and they can decide whether you're going to move from one place to the next and it's this beautiful part. Rick plans to retire here. And I actually asked him that question when I got hired. I was like, well, what happens if they move you? What happens to me? He's like, I'm not going anywhere. I was like, I like this guy. So... You're stuck with him. You're stuck with me for a while. But I remember when we had decided to move here, we had this kind of tour of homes that there were certain people that we needed to, to break this news to before uh, we just went public with it. And, and so I remember going to all these different people and telling, hey, we're, we're moving. But I can only imagine how much weirder it would have been. Like, I'm going somewhere, but I can't tell you where. <laughs> you know, like witness protection kind of stuff. <laughs> But it was weird enough, and so Jesus is telling you, hey, where I'm going, uh, you can't go either. And then he inserts like a little mini lesson. He says, hey, I'm going to give you a new commandment right in the middle of all this weirdness. I'm going to give you a new commandment. Love one another just as I have loved you. Just as I have loved you. All kinds of crazy going on in this meal. I don't know if you've ever been in a church service where there's something out of the ordinary uh, distracting happens, and nobody can ever get back on track with what's going on. That's kind of what happened with the, the mini lesson there. Uh, Jesus drops this truth bomb on them, and they can't get past what he had just said. I remember in high school, I was in a youth choir. We were singing up, singing around Christmas, and this kid in front of me, he did the, the worst thing you can do. He locked those knees up. He started doing the swaying, and it wasn't because like, he was in the spirits because he wasn't getting enough oxygen. <laughs> he just like fell right off the stage. I don't remember anything else that happened that day. I don't remember a thing that the preacher preached. I don't remember a song that we sung, but I remember Jeremy laying face down on the floor. Uh, and that's kind of what happened here. And Jesus says, a new commandment I give you. Love one another as I have loved you. And Peter, he's like, um, where are you going? <laughs> it just like goes right over there. Like, now tell me again where you're going. And Je Jesus reiterates, hey, you can't follow me now, but a little bit later, you know, you can come. And so Peter uh, kind of puts his foot in his mouth. He goes as far as to say, hey, I would lay down my very life for you, Jesus. And then Jesus reveals to him that, Peter, you are going to deny even knowing who I am three times within the next few hours. This meal with Jesus has to qualify as one of the most bombshell dropping meals in the history of dining. And I think sometimes we can miss out uh, on just the humanness of some of these situations. We, we read these things in our devotion and we gloss over them, but we don't insert ourselves into the situation to realize that there was a lot of tension here. And that brings us to the passage that we're going to look at today. And so if you have your Bible, you can turn to John chapter 14. We're going to look at the first seven verses. If you don't, it'll be on the screen uh, behind me. Jesus says, he starts right out, do not let your hearts be troubled. I think he was looking around at the faces of those men who were eating this meal with him, and he realized they had been shaken to their core. That they had been shaken to their core. And he starts out, do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me so that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? And Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and you have seen him. Let's pray. Father, would you be with us in these next few moments? Would you help us discover the heart behind these words? May we lean into your heart today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So these dudes are completely stressed out. 
They're, they're worried and have fear etched over every crevice of their face, faith. And into that moment, Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. These have become some of the most controversial words that have been written in Scripture. And I'm going to unpack that just a little bit. Uh, People who stand outside of the Christian faith will often use these words uh, to throw at those of us who stand inside the Christian faith to say, what kind of an arrogant, what, what kind of an exclusive claim is that, that Jesus would stand there and that, that he would say that he is the only way to God. This is the, the problem with Christianity is that it is so narrow. And here, here are the words. See, right there he says, I, I'm the way, I'm the truth of life. No one comes to the Father but by me. And some of you are like, yeah, that, that, that's what he's saying. Let's unpack this. I'm the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. So I think this attitude makes an assumption that we are talking about the same God. I think sometimes when we get into these conversations and we're talking about God, we're talking about a God that looks very different from the God of the person that that we're interacting with right here. We're we're talking about God, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. We're Christianity is a a monotheistic religion, yes, and we have this specific understanding of who God is. And usually the people that we are talking with are not talking about that God. It's more talking about some nebulous force or vibe or kind of a Santa Claus in the sky that encourages us to do what makes us happy. We're not talking about a path to the same God. We're talking about two different things, but we use this word God and we get all confused right there. And so people standing outside the church use these words and say it's such a a narrow, narrow, arrogant thing for Jesus to say. But this isn't what Jesus is saying. Jesus came in flesh and bone. Basically what Jesus is trying to say in these words is, I am the Father, the Father is in me, I have the very heart of the Father, and I came with skin and bones to show you what the Father looks like. My grace is huge. It is, it is open to the, the worst of the sinners, the worst of the worst. There is no one who can do something so bad that it stands outside of my grace to cover that mess up. And so what he's... He's not trying to make a a claim where his religion is better than this religion, or this person is in, or this person is out. He is telling these guys whose heart are troubled, hey, this is peace and comfort. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. That's what Jesus is saying to these guys. I'm, I'm trying to comfort your heart and to make these words as something that is Exclusive. I think Jesus would want these to be the words that we use to roll out the red carpet, to invite people into the way, his truth, and the life that comes with all of that. And so sometimes these words can be used against us. On the other side of the coin, over the years, we have seen Christians use these words as a club to beat down other people. Uh, our agnostic or our atheist friends or the people who like to get into the religious conversations with us. We use these as the, the silencer verse. Well, you know, Jesus basically said that his religion trumps all other religions because he said, I am the way, the truth, the life, not a way, a truth, a life. And so this has been the verse that has been used to shut down conversations with those who don't believe. When once again, I think Jesus would want us to say, oh, let me tell you, in relationship. Let me tell you about this Jesus that I have met. I've surrendered my life over to him, and I've been, I've been living my life according to his way, the truths that are revealed to me. And let me tell you, my life isn't always easy, but there's a fullness and a richness to life that comes in living this Jesus way of life. These should be words of invitation, not shutting down conversations. I want to be honest. The the goal for Jesus was never heaven like it has become for us. 
He came to establish this upside down kingdom, a way of life where we are known by our love for God, for one another, the way that we love our enemies, and for the love that we give away, sacrificially and self giving in nature. See, these words were meant to be good news, to let the disciples know that they are on the right track, that they need not worry because they know the Father because of their relationship with Jesus. It's automatic. It's automatic. If you know Jesus, you know the Father. You, you know this God that you've been pursuing because Jesus is him in, in the flesh and blood. We have a fancy word for that, incarnation. Incarnation. He came. He came to show us the way. And so into that awkward moment at dinner where he can see the fear and the stress and the worry all over their face, he says, I don't know, these are words of peace. These are words of comfort. These aren't fighting words. Have you ever heard that phrase? Those are fighting words. Oh, I think it would break Jesus' heart. Break Jesus' heart to know that these have become fighting words. When these were words that were meant to give peace and comfort to the men who were closest to him. Now here's something interesting. So that's one context where these words were given is a, a, a gift of peace to people who were, who were stressed. When John wrote his account, his gospel account, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, gospel, good news, the account of Jesus' life. He wrote his account later than all of the other guys. It's, it's just understood. The scholars have figured this stuff out. And it, it really didn't get to the early church until around the turn of the first century. So it was 60 to 70 years after Jesus had died that the, the early church got the, the book of John. So why would John include these words these words that Jesus had spoken decades and decades and decades before to the early church. Well, some stuff had happened between the time that Jesus died, rose again, and ascended to heaven. About 40 years after Jesus died, some of the, the Jews revolted against Rome. They decided to go to war against Rome and, and try to take them down. Well, it didn't go well. They got squashed. And a lot of the Christians uh, did not participate in that revolt. And so there was this break between uh, the Jewish synagogues and the, the early church Christians where they had been able to worship together up to a point. After this happened, they were divided and they were refused entrance to the synagogues. And so this early church, these Christians who had had this place of welcome and comfort, this blanket in this, uh, this messed up world that they were in, they were no longer allowed to be there. Can you imagine if something crazy happened and you, you came to church one day and were like, no, you can't be here. Yeah, but I've been coming here for 20 years. These are my people. They're like, no, you get out of here. You go figure this out on your own. That's what was going on. And so then there was this emperor that, that came to power and his name was Nero and he actually set fire to Rome, but he blamed it on the Christians. And so the early church be, basically became enemies of the state of Rome. And then there was this awful emperor. His name was Domitian and history just records his violent treatment of Christians. And so the early church found themselves ousted by their, their fellow believers and considered enemies of Rome. And so these people were struggling big time. This pastor Rob Fuquay says, the fuller context helps us understand not only how Jesus might have intended these words for his hearers at the time, his disciples, but also why they would be included in a gospel account written 70 years after he said them. Instead of being used as weapons to convince others they are wrong, these words were meant to assure Christ followers that their faith was genuine, their connection to Christ real, and their path one that leads to the Father. It's important to understand the heart behind the words that have been spoken before we can truly understand what they mean. See, these words were a gift of peace and comfort to the disciples they were a gift of peace and comfort to the early church, and I believe God intends them to be words of peace and comfort to those seasons when we find our hearts troubled. Not words to keep people out, but words to draw people into the very heart of the Father. These aren't fighting words. These are words that should wrap us like a warm blanket on a cold night when we are going through the difficulties of life. This is good news. This is gospel. 
that is how those words were intended to be received and how I believe we need to receive them today. And the beautiful thing is in just a moment, we are going to partake of a meal that was instituted in the middle of that really weird dinner that night. It is a beautiful thing that came from all of that strangeness and all of that tension. And so today is, um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna say a prayer and we're gonna come to the table and, and eat of this meal together. I pray that you'd be able to meditate on these words. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Can we hear Jesus saying, oh yeah, I am the Father with skin and bones on. If you know me, of course, you know him. This is the fullness of life that I'm inviting you into. Let's pray. Father, you're a good God. We thank you for these words. Would you forgive us for turning them so often into something that uh, they weren't intended to be? Uh, we've, we've turned them into words to fight over, to debate over, uh, to point fingers at one another and say who's in and who's out. When God, you're just inviting into us into the fullness of all that you are. Our desires to live our lives on the path that you lead for us, your way, that we would come to understand that the truths that you give us are, are for our own good and that they leave us, they lead us into the full and complete life that you have for us. Not necessarily an easy life, but a life where you journey step by step by our side. We pray this. In Jesus' name, amen.